Uh, hello guys, welcome to the Tank Index, and today I'm going to talk about the Gross Tractor. You are really going to excuse my German in this video because I'm Polish, okay? And that means I did not learn German, okay? Um, I learned Polish, and that kind of translates, but uh, not probably the entire bottle. Um, so today we're going to talk, be talking about our first interwar German tank, the Gross Tractor. So we really talk about the after effect of World War One. World War One had a very interesting effect on the Weimar Republic. And you know later, even World War Two. I don't know why I put the one there. The Weimar Republic did a full examination of what happened in the war and found they had actually developed the perfect anti-trench tactic with their stormtroopers, or stormtroopers, in the last stage of the war. However, they found that one other thing was vital for the fast, um, you know, the fast anti-trench tactic, tanks. Unfortunately, this little thing called the Versailles Treaty didn't exactly allow tanks. So, in 1925, the Reichswehr decided to say fuck it to the Versailles Treaty and found a loophole. Technically, they didn't have tanks. Tanks, They had agricultural tractors. This is how the Reichswehr disguised the gross tractor, which literally translates to large tractor or heavy tractor. They decided to l l look at the Soviet Union since they didn't also, since, they, you know, they also really didn't like the capitalistic monarchies of the West. In the U.S. are agreed, having the Kama Tank School for the Reichswehr troops to use for training to avoid the watchful eyes of Britain and France. Um, the original prototype was designed by the German government itself, being made in 1926. It was 15 tons and armed with a 7.6 centimeter gun, being only 6 feet long and 2 feet wide, which is much smaller than what it would eventually become. Um, the German government wasn't completely pleased with the ar arm army wagon. Um, so instead they decided to let three German industrial giants try for it, uh, you know, each giving them really a base layup to use, but they get to modify the design for themselves. Krupp, Daimler Benz, and Rheinmetall would each make a prototype design. Each design would have two prototypes built of it. The contracts were given to the companies in March of 1927 with a varied level of cooperation between the three. So on to the Krupp tank. The Krupp tank weighed 16 and a half tons with a coil spring suspension. And the lowest qual quantity of fuel at 370 liters, and while technically having a maximum speed of 27 miles per hour, it was only really able to have a sustainable speed of 16. Um, which was actually still a lot for the time, even though the engine would be incredibly expensive. The design was 12 uh, feet and w 1 inch tall, 9 foot 1 inch wide, and 8 feet and 1 inches tall. Sorry, it was... Sorry. I misspoke. It was 12 feet 1 inches long, 9 feet, feet 1 inch wide, and 8 foot 1 inch tall. Onto the Daimler Benz tank. The tank weighed 16 tons with a leaf spring suspension. With 400 liters of fuel, it was able to go 25 miles per hour. Um, it was 21 feet 10 inches long, 9 foot 1 inch wide, and 8 feet tall. So you can tell, I mean, these guys were pretty big boys. Um, onto the Orion Metal design, it weighed 16 tons with a hydraulic suspension system. It held 480 liters of fuel, letting it go 25 miles per hour. The tank was 8 foot 6 inches long, 8 foot 6 inches wide, and 8 foot 3 inches tall, making it the smallest design. Um, they had similarities between them. The designs were all different, but they did have similarities. They had a 75mm, 7.5cm howitzer. Um, and two 7.9 inch machine guns, one in the front hull and one in a sub turret near the back. They all had 6.4, 6 to 14 millimeters of soft steel armor, a six man crew, and a 290 horsepower engine. The, both the Rheinmetall and Daimler Benz have the same turrets made by Rheinmetall, while the Krupp one was unique. Um, the six gross tractors were built by Rheinmetall in their shop in Unterlus, with production starting in August of 1928. It was completed a year later by the end of June and were sent to the Kama Tank School by the Russian village of Kazan, arriving in July. While the Nazis did technically inherit the tanks when they went to power, they really didn't do anything. They gave, used them for a bit of training, but eventually they had other tanks to do that better with and literally just turned them into monuments, as you can see. They just put it on some stone and that's it, which... Eh, okay. Um, these prototypes were actually pretty good. Um, they are pretty fast for heavy tanks, and compared to other countries with their 37mm guns, the 75mm gun was amazing, even if it was a howitzer, so a eh range. A six-man crew wasn't too bad for a tank to size, and like I said, speed is impressive. 
The prototypes allowed for Germany to really start training tank crews, begin an industry for tanks and war vehicles, and getting an experience with more modern tanks, um, especially for the companies. You know, I mean, Rheinmetall, Krupp, these tanks would make these con uh, companies would make a lot of vehicles during the war. You know, and this is really where it started. These tanks would be far too expensive for mass production, really, as well as having really poor armor for a heavy tank. I mean, it's not even real steel; it's soft steel. But for the time when most countries weren't really dabbling in heavy tanks in the 20s, it was a pretty good design all in all.